the role of vegetables in the diet is similar to what we would call vitamin pills. They're not for calories or proteins or fat. The idea of eating kale salad because kale has some protein in it is a complete misunderstanding of the role of vegetables or greens in the diet. They're not for proteins, they're not for fat, they're not for calories. They're for the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the minerals, the vitamins, etc. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hoda Labrata Gore. This is episode 79, and my guest is Dr. Tom Cowan. Tom is a holistic health physician in California. He is the author of Cosmic Heart, Human Heart, and he has our heart. Seriously, Tom is an informed, inquisitive man who we always love to have on the show because he makes us think. And today he discusses the role of vegetables in our diet. All our lives, we've been told to eat our vegetables, but Tom actually tells us why this advice is critical for our health. I have to admit, I'm always shooting for nutrient density, and so I kind of look down on vegetables, but this conversation with Tom has woken me up to realize how important they are. Before we get into the conversation, we want to remind you that we have a special offer for podcast listeners through the end of May which means there are just a couple of days left. Go to the podcast page of the westonaprice.org website. There you'll find the podcast special. For $7, you can get three of our favorite resources. It's a great way to get acquainted with the Wise Traditions diet. And Wise Traditions is supported in part by Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant, the probiotic everyone's talking about. Go to thriveprobiotic.com. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So as little kids, everybody always told us, you got to eat your vegetables. You've taken this to heart suddenly. Can you tell us why? Well, it's not so much suddenly, I would say. I have always been a fan, always meaning for 35, 40 years, of traditional diets. And in fact, even as a child, I was really interested in Native Americans and what they did and how they lived. And always wanted more and more details and ended up spending two years living in rural Swaziland in the Peace Corps. So I had a, you know, actual firsthand living experience. And it was some, a long time ago, I can't remember when, when I read and realized from also living in Africa that traditional people ate sometimes about a hundred or so vegetables a year and up to 10 to 15 a day. Wait, wait, wait. Traditional people eat that much? How is it possible? Don't they always say, oh, the people from the Paleolithic era were just eating meat, right? How is it that they ate so many vegetables? So the best source of this, which is to me the best source of the actual sort of gory details of a traditional diet, was a book called Tending the Wild, which was a book detailing the life history and food habits of the native Californians. Mm. And there was a group of Californians which near where I currently live in San Francisco called the Miwok Indians. And in there, there's a chart listing the 120, I happen to know the exact amount, different vegetables that they ate in a year. Wow. And so these were things like tubers that they dug, leaves of trees, perennial greens, you know, greens that come up like nettles is an example of a perennial green. Sometimes they tended them, so they did have what we would call annual vegetables, you know, like uh, modern squash and tomatoes and stuff. They didn't have tomatoes, but they ate a lot of different vegetables, not a huge quantity of any of them, but in addition to their, you know, other food, that was a huge part of their diet. Swazi, same thing. They had a lot of different particularly green vegetables, that they ate small amounts almost every day. And how did that affect their health? Well, my take on it, you know, so I knew that it's like having the answer to the puzzle before you start, and then you have to go backwards and figure out what the question was and to answer the question of how did it affect your health. 
it led me to develop because I'm a schemer by nature. So I ended up developing a scheme of what the traditional diet looked like. The reason is, is because if you follow this traditional scheme, you end up with really good health. So once, once I figured out the rules of the game, the scheme, so to speak, you could see how this high vegetable variety actually fit into this. And if you want, I can tell you the scheme. Tell us. So the scheme was that all these people ate, all traditional people, indigenous people, the people that's price studied, the people who the anthropologists and the explorers said, oh, these guys have perfect health. They all ate animal food as their basic staple. And we're talking about for proteins and fats primarily. And that's, you know, the bodybuilding food and the main source of calories from fats. So to me, whether they ate fish or chickens or insects or buffalo or whatever, all that's the same. It's one category of food. It's the animal food part of the diet. And there's no exceptions. There was no vegan human cultures that did well. Mm -hmm. So that's the first food group. The second food group is what I call the seed group. And... It could be anything from tree nuts, which are seeds, so to speak, or you know, nuts and seeds. Or it could be more modern people who ate more like grains, like Hopi uh, Indians ate corn. So all those are seeds. And the primary benefit of seeds is for carbohydrates, fiber, and other nutrients that come along with uh, you know, cashews, almonds, etc. One of the things that I would say is that by and large, a large, you know, through the work of Sally and the paleo movement, we have similar foods of those two groups as paleo people. Or, That's right. So they have they had wild buffalo. We have grass fed meat. They had wild fish. We have wild fish. Not quite the same quality, but at least close. Mm -hmm. The same with like nuts, like cashews, almonds. I mean. Probably theirs were more ecologically grown and not so much pesticides and all that. But mm -hmm. basically, we have almonds and cashews and um, you know tree nuts too. The grains have been overly hybridized, but now there's a movement to get them back. So we have ancient grains even coming more and more available. But the third category was vegetables, of which they ate, again, a wide variety, even up to 5 to 10 a day, 100 a year. Roots, leaves, fruits, flowers, annuals, perennials, wild, etc. And the typical American, even the typical person who's eating an, quote, ancestral or nourishing traditions diet, eats broccoli and romaine lettuce, neither of which were around 200 years ago. Right. So true. And that's their version of an ancestral diet or nourishing traditions diet which doesn't have the vegetable part correct. People ate wild vegetables, root vegetables, tubers, lots of different colors, all the different ways you can create variety. And the role of vegetables in the diet is similar to what we would call vitamin pills. Uh -huh. They're not for calories or proteins or fat. The idea of eating kale salad because kale has some protein in it is a complete misunderstanding of the role of vegetables or greens in the diet. They're not for proteins, they're not for fat, they're not for calories. They're for the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the minerals, the vitamins, etc., like what we would call vitamin pills. And the strategy should be getting a wide variety, I keep going back to that, so that you get every single nutrient available in the plant kingdom. Red vegetables have some nutrients, purple ones have different ones. We know the big long names, which I can hardly pronounce, but all of them have disease fighting properties. They're what the plant uses to keep itself healthy. And humans have adapted to small doses of these to keep us healthy. They're like the disease prevention part of the, of the diet and the proteins and fats and seeds are the fuel and bodybuilding and frame maintaining part of the diet. Well, and it may be that one reason we haven't gotten into all those vegetables is we can't find them, right? Yes. 
we only see the carrots at the store and the kale and a couple things, and it's the same thing over and over. It's exactly. So 20-some years ago, I decided to set out to eat 15 a day and 100 a year. And as you said, I quickly found out that even in a San Francisco farmer's market, which is one of the five best farmer's markets in the world, it's one of the vegetable growing centers of the, of the world right now, there's no perennial vegetables, there's no wild vegetables, and you can get about 20 different vegetables a year, but it's a real pain to, you know, come home from the farmer's market with 20 different vegetables and cut them and chop them every day. So I started, you know, because I taught gardening in the Peace Corps, so I was a pretty avid gardener, I started growing stuff, growing perennials, things got more and more and more until I had 50 vegetables I could eat you know, in a year and say 10 in a day, but I still was spending an hour and a half chopping and cleaning and morning soup was leeks and carrots and beets and onions and, and spinach and arugula. And it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> even for me. And so I, but I kept doing it because that was my goal. I was convinced that, uh, you know, that was the traditional diet. And so I was doing it, but it was not something that I could, I could go out into the world because people can't do it. I'd end up with three patients. Exactly. We'd so, all be like, um, nice recommendation, but we can't put into practice. Right, exactly. So that was where I was about a year and a half ago. Still doing it myself, but not really seeing the avenue to make this into the, the vegetable revolution that I was envisioning. So what happened next? Well, two things happened then. One is a friend gave me access to about an acre already established vegetable garden in Napa and even graciously offered to keep growing seedlings for me in his greenhouse. So it was all the beds. There's 40, 70-foot, 4-foot wide beds. They were all hand dug wow. and irrigated in a beautiful section of Napa. And it's not my land, but the owner basically was letting us grow whatever we wanted. And that's way, way, way more than any family could eat. Uh, but, you know, I was interested in gardening, so I started growing everything I could think of there. And a lot of it. And the other thing that happened is I happened to go to a restaurant that's one of the high-end San Francisco restaurants. And their calling card, and they had a, a, a display rack of about 80 different powdered vegetables. Ah. So they flavor their food with these concentrated kale powder, or burnt toast powder, or charred eggplant powder, uh -huh. or squash powder. And they wrote a cookbook about it, and they, they do it for purely culinary reasons. Uh -huh. Because... When you put charred eggplant powder, it t makes the fish taste amazing. Oh. So they were doing it for culinary reasons. Coming up, learn how Tom was able to incorporate vegetables into his own diet in a way that's manageable, sustainable, and tasty. We want to pause now and thank our sponsors. Wise Traditions is supported in part by Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Most probiotic pills just pass through our bodies without achieving the desired result. Microbiologist Kieran Krishnan, whom I interviewed on episode 69, he recommends a spore-based probiotic like Just Thrive Probiotic. Just Thrive is the first 100% spore-forming probiotic that arrives alive in the intestines naturally. It supports optimal gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. It's great for adults, kids, the whole family. The probiotic everyone's talking about, Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Visit their website at Thrive probiotic.com. Hey, and there are just a couple of days left to take advantage of the Wise Traditions Starter Kit. It is a podcast special just for you. Visit our website, go to the podcast page, and click on Podcast Special. It's a bundle of our three most popular brochures and resources. The first is the Dietary Principles brochure, basically the list of the 11 principles that define the Wise Traditions diet. 
The second is the Healthy for Life booklet. It gives recipes and a framework for how to eat the wise traditions way. And the Shopping Guide is a 92-page resource that lists brand names so you can figure out which foods are good, which are best, and which you should avoid altogether. These three resources normally go for about $14, but the special means you can get them for just 7 So go to the podcast page, click on the star that says Podcast Special, and take advantage of this special offer through the end of May. The two things happened almost simultaneously, and it was like a light went off. Hey, if I processed our vegetables in the way that I eat them, in other words, I eat kale by blanching it. Mm-hmm. So if I go and blanch the kale and then dehydrate it, it was also, I had also known about something called mirror jars, which are jars that the urban myth is they were found in the pyramids and the oil was still fresh in them. People ate the oil and, and they were these deep purple jars that are very thick. And some, a Swiss engineering firm got a hold of them and reverse engineered them. They found out they only let in UVA light and a few other wavelengths, and things don't deteriorate inside the jar oh. because of the screening of the light, which, of course, I was skeptical of, but I took two cherry tomatoes and put one in a glass jar and one in a mirror jar, and the one in the glass jar, the mason glass, rotted in a, about eight weeks, and the one in the mirror jar was perfectly normal after six months. Oh my gosh. And you can see the pictures on our website. Uh-huh. So that convinced me that there is a science and a reality behind this. And if I could take these powders and process them in the way that I would eat them, and then immediately grind them and put them into a mirror jar so that they would be fresh and even though this is a heretical thing to say, maybe even energetically enhanced the longer they sit in the jar. I'm Uh not sure I know what that means exactly, but at least they don't lose their smell and their taste over at least a year, we Mm -hmm. know. That then I would be able to get wild ramps and fiddleheads and tree collards and Okinawan spinach and choya buds and and all these wild foods and indigenous foods and mix them together and powder them and put them in my oatmeal and put them on the fish and put them in salad dressing. And not only would it be the best tasting food I've ever eaten because we get these amazing concentrated vegetable flavors, but it's like I say, you, not you in particular, but you eat soaked oatmeal with butter and yogurt, which is fine. Right. But I eat soaked oatmeal with a teaspoon of three different kinds of heirloom beets and two different kinds of winter squash and a little bit of even peppers, that six different peppers. So I've now eaten 12 vegetables with my oatmeal, and my oatmeal (laughs) tastes better than your oatmeal. (laughs) And it's not that I don't eat oatmeal and butter and all the stuff that we, those are the first two parts of the diet. But I get to eat lots of different flavors and vegetables, and it's no more difficult than opening the 26 jars lined up on my counter and putting a teaspoon in the oatmeal. So I went, we had a family vacation, and I showed, you know, my kids this stuff. I said, I'll bet if we made these, we could sell them. So why don't, I'll grow stuff and you grow stuff, and we'll all put them in mirror jars. It turns out it's a lot more complicated. (laughs) And so a year later, now we have this burgeoning business selling these powdered vegetables, a lot of which we still grow. And so people can have that variety that traditional peoples had and without all the hassle, like you said, of going to the farmer's market and chopping everything up. Now, I'm glad you mentioned putting it on oatmeal because I kept picturing tossing these powders in broth and making soup but it sounds like there are a lot of applications for i mean we did we did a whole you know how and why to eat more vegetables book which uh, my my one son asher is the ceo of the business he's the businessman my other son joe is the production guy but joe happens to be by far the best cook in the family as i say i heat up food but he cooks there's a difference (laughs) Like, I can heat food up and it tastes like the food, but there's a difference with cooking like a real chef. 
So he does that and he works with the powders. And so you can do it anything from making eggs and sprinkling kale and, and pepper salt on the, on the eggs. That's one way to do it. And another way to do it is to make dishes. And one of the things we did was we had Sally came over for dinner a, a few months ago and we made pumpkin pie with our pumpkin powder instead of fresh or canned pumpkin. And I can quote her that said it was the best pumpkin pie she ever made, uh, ever ate. And it was just our pumpkin powder with water, uh -huh. uh, so it was sort of reconstituted. Because it was about one and a half big Hopi heirloom pumpkins in that half a cup of, or so of powder. Uh -huh. So it was a lot of concentrated pumpkin flavor. And I'm very, you know, I'm the head gardener, and so I'm very careful about the varieties and the taste. Mm -hmm. And I work with this friend, John, who's all about flavor, you know, how to garden for flavor, what to put in the soil to make your tomatoes taste more tomatoey. He's helping me do that, and it's partly variety, partly timing, partly amendments to the soil. I'm not talking about chemical fertilizer. I'm talking about volcanic rock dust type stuff, you know, and certain types of compost. So it's fun. I mean, it's all about getting the best flavor, the best variety, and the best variety from way back, you know, like turning the clock back. How long has it been that you've been eating this way, adding these uh, vegetable powders and really adding the variety of vegetables in your own diet? About a year and a half. And... Other people have started trying this too. Have people recognized any differences? Can you tell us any stories in terms of health benefits? The main one we hear stories about is the beet powder because beets are known to increase nitrous oxide and have a vasodilator effect and treat high blood pressure. And again, you can put beet powder in chocolate. You know, it's a sort of traditional culinary thing. Or you can put it in a smoothie or oatmeal or whatever. So I've had a bunch of people whose blood pressure has been improved. And, you know, sexual function improves like any kind of, I mean, Viagra is a vasodilator. So I've, I've actually heard those. <laughs> the other one, which is been a, uh, some of them were having struggles with production because we ha only have so much space and nobody's growing like this Ashitaba, which is a very therapeutics in the Angelica family and it's a wonderful plant even has some chemotherapy effects in it helps with arthritis some people have used that and said their arthritis is better and we're now actively seeking out growers in our area to supplement what we can grow and so that seems to be working. So Tom I have to admit I'm one of those people who leans more toward the fat and the protein part of my diet and I don't I'm not heavy on the vegetables what would eventually happen to someone whose diet is deficient in this variety of vegetables you're describing? I mean, the best way to answer that is, is generally speaking, with very few exceptions, like maybe the Inuit, people always used a lot of variety and a small amount of vegetables as disease prevention strategy. It's not that the bulk of the food wasn't these fats, proteins, and carbohydrate-rich seeds. It was. That still should be the bulk of the diet. But, I mean, I, I'm not willing to say this such and such bad will happen to you if you don't <laughs> eat vegetables. I, I wouldn't go that far. But I also think that given the blueprint of what we know works, and given that you're trying to get small amounts of these phytonutrients, not like fatty acids and even certain vitamins, those you can get from animal foods, but... You can't get lycopene, which is, helps with prostate health from any kind of animal food that I know of. So, and there's a whole host of these anthocyanins, which prevent cataracts and prevent diabetes and reduce inflammation. They're the, the vitamin cofactors of our diet. So I would include them in the diet. Now, what about people whose diet leans completely the other way? They're more plant-based or more vegetable-based? What are they missing out on? Well, they're trying to, to, in my view, incorrectly get fats, proteins, and carbohydrates from vegetables. That's not the role of, of plant foods in the diet, or of vegetables. The role of vegetables is these 
phytonutrient chemicals, essentially, and maybe energies, too. Uh, it's hard to say, but something like that. Not macronutrients. And to, to think, you know, buffalo bull back fat did not sit down and eat kale salad for lunch. <laughs> he ate wild greens that were picked a little bit, but the, the main food was the back fat of the buffalo. Mm. So I got his name. To, to miss that whole point is a misunderstanding, in my view, of human nutrition. And yet it's a big trend now, isn't it? It's a big trend. But there's a lot of mistaken trends in this country, so that's just one of them. What I do like about it is that people are opting out of the processed foods. So in a way, that's good, but they're missing some other elements that are critical for our health, it sounds like. Yes. Although in a funny sort of way, you could say that our food is also processed. Uh, but it's processed meaning we've done the cooking of the kale for you. So we blanched it and then sort of fixed it at that blanching point. Or we bake the pumpkins, very labor-intensive process. But we bake heirloom pumpkins and then fix it at that point. So it is a kind of processed food in a sense. Right. But there, believe me, there's no other ingredient in our pumpkin powder or Swiss chard powder but Swiss chard and pumpkins. Well, and you keep talking about these special jars. Um, and at first when you mentioned them, I thought you meant mirrored like they have mirrors in the jars. Is that? No, but it, can you spell the name of the jar? I'm just curious. Yeah, M-I-R-O-N. Okay, Mirren. Mirren jar. I think there's a French pronunciation, but. Oh, okay. It's mirror jars. And there's some knockoffs, but the the real mirror jars are because of the particular color, which is really shimmering violet, and the thickness. And again, they only they screen out pretty much all of the wavelengths of light except UVA, and UVA produces regeneration and energetic enhancement of the content. Wow, and the contents sound really powerful. So I really appreciate your time today. I have one final question. If the listener could only do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? I mean, eat a nourishing tradition style. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Thanks for your time. Thank you. My guest today was Dr. Tom Cowan. You can meet him and hear him in person if you come to the Wise Traditions Conference in Minneapolis in November. Just go to wisetraditions.com for that information. And check out his website, drcowansgarden.com. That's doctor, just D-R, cowansgarden.com. And get a look at the powders we were discussing today. And for highlights from the episode and links to resources we mentioned, go to the westonaprice.org website and click on the show notes for episode 79. Hey, and a special thanks to Olivia Stanforth for her help with this week's show notes and to Sarah Fernandez from Podcast Village for her editing support. I love and appreciate you too. Hey, and learn more about Podcast Village and their work training podcasters and producing and promoting episodes at podcastvillage.com. Finally, I have to tell you that we are at 98 reviews on iTunes. Help us make it to 100. It's a nice round number that we would love to see. Thanks so much ahead of time. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with others. Post a link on Facebook or Twitter or send a link to a friend in an email or simply review Wise Traditions on iTunes. Sharing the podcast is one way to spread the important message of health through nutrition. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming in the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.